Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 68. This episode is Ian White, and Ian is one of those people that you look at their resume and you start to question just how much awesome one person can handle. And uh, if you're Ian White, the answer is a lot. We talk about how he was a professional basketball player for quite a few years, and then he got into acting from there. And his first movie, right out the gate, was Alien vs. Predator, in which he played the Predator. But if you've seen that movie, it's awesome, and he is awesome in it. And he went on to be in Harry Potter. He was the uh, the body of Madame Maxime. He went on to do Prometheus. He's in Star Wars. He's in Game of Thrones. We cover all that good stuff. And it's just, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me how many amazing things Ian has done. And he does them so well. Uh, and it was just an absolute pleasure to talk to him. So I'm just going to get to it. Without further ado... Please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 68, with Ian White. Theme song time. going into big cities, I was like, I don't understand how you're able to cope. <laughs> well, you know, to each their own. <laughs> Where are you from? Originally? Yeah. Grew up in Brighton. Oh, right on. What is that like? On the south coast. Very nice. Yeah. My parents still live there. I visit every, well, I know, about two or three times a year. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Right on, right on. So uh, I, I have to, out the gate, I mean, I'm sure you get this question like a million times in the world, but uh, how tall exactly are you? <laughs> Very. Yeah, <laughs> fair. That, you know what? I like that. I like that answer a lot. <laughs> that that uh, should be an official measurement. Yes, yeah, exactly. I'm a man who is seven foot one inches tall. Wow, seven foot one. Did you hit like a massive growth spurt when you were growing up? I stopped growing when I was 17 years old. Wow. Seven foot one at 17? Yes, it was um, a difficult childhood. Sure. Man, I, I didn't even make 5'8", so I kind of envy you, but did, uh, did I'm assuming... Well, actually, this is a horrible assumption. Did you play sports? Yeah, I played basketball for... Well, I played professionally for nine years. What? I didn't know that. You're a professional yeah. basketball player? Well, it's not, you know, it's not on the level of the NBA. Sure. It's far removed from, you know, from that. But, uh, yeah, I bounced around Europe for about nine years. No way. No pun intended. Oh. <laughs> so what? what is that even like? I've actually never talked to someone who's played professional basketball. Well, you know, I was just, you know, I was pursuing a dream. Sure. Sure. And, uh, this dream and you know basketball was uh, you know was the key to my dreams and and I put every ounce of myself into it for as long as I could until I got bored sure it happens you know it happens to a lot of professional athletes you know they well you know you wake up one day and wonder I'm sure there's more to life right right it also seems like a lot of work too. any kind of sport like I oh, just, yeah. just got done watching the World Cup and like they're running miles and miles and miles. And I'm like, and that's just a game. That doesn't even count all the practice that goes into it. And basketball is, you know, is exactly the same. It, you know, it, it demands every ounce of your effort. It, you sure. know, and I, I worked very hard to be very mediocre. <laughs> sure. I was, but I, I was, I was, you know, marginally successful in my career. Right on. I played Played for teams in France, in Belgium, in Portugal, Greece, and in England. Wow, is it? How does it work over there? Like, do you? I'm assuming you played in school, and then you join a team, and then they can kind of trade you around. Like, I have no yeah, concept. I sound terrible. <laughs> well, Play much in in school when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, played for another team, and then I went to America, and I went to college states. Really? Uh, played NCA ball for, 
for four years. Really? And then I came back to Europe and I started off in London and I played for two teams in London and then and then went uh, I went to mainland Europe. Started off in France. Gotcha, gotcha. That's you know I've actually heard a similar kind of thing as well with um, Eunice. You know Sotomo plays um, Chewbacca in the new movies. He yeah. played in uh, Finland, I believe it was, and then he also went to college in the states as well, and then played basketball there. Is that, is, that a, is that a common thing that happens? Yeah, it's quite common, especially from the UK, because the you know the basketball in in America is obviously vastly superior. The competition is vastly superior than we find over here. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, back in the day when I did it, you know, it was. You know, it was just becoming a a popular thing to do. Sure. We were we were kind of blazing trails. Right, right. That's cool went, though, playing all over Europe in different countries as well. I went over to the states in 1990, and uh, and you know there were very few people before then who had who had done who had made that journey, made that sort of sacrifice. Sure. Just... It is a lot to ask for sure, especially to pick up, and it is it is far, the, the, the across the pond, if you will. Oh, I was dreadfully homesick. I can imagine. Man, and you played for years. You said here too. That's crazy. So when did when did you go from ba- like being a professional basketball player to like an interest in acting? Was that something that you were interested in prior, or something you fell into? Nothing. I really thought of in terms of a as a career mm-hmm. no i had an opportunity and i grabbed hold of it with two hands and i didn't let go hey there you go 2003 and it was one of those kismet moments sure uh they had the casting director had, had actually contacted the team that i was playing for at the time and said look we're looking for someone that's seven feet tall slim fit uh, to play the, the a part in this uh, in this upcoming movie, can you recommend anyone? Mm-hmm. And I, I had a phone call from the secretary of the club, and she said, "Look, we've got this casting director on the phone." <laughs> and my first reaction was, "Nobody wants to put me in a movie. Pull the other one." <laughs> uh, so I said, "Look, if, if you're not having me on, then just pass on my pass on my details." And five minutes later, the phone rang. It was it was the casting director. And she invited me to audition for Alien vs. Predator. What? That was your first movie? My first movie. Dude. In at the deep end. Wow. Dude, I ju- no joke, I just watched that movie last week. It's so, no. it's so good and it totally holds up. I didn't know that was your first movie. What a way to go in. Well done. And you, like, you were, uh, I know you played the Predator in that, right? Right. Wow. What was what was that? Well, they wanted you for your height as well. Did did you have to audition after that? Well, I auditioned for the casting director. Then I met the director. Mm-hmm. Then about two or three weeks later, I flew to Prague where the movie was going to be shot to meet the um, the creature effects designers. Oh yeah. And it was about two or three weeks after that when I got the phone call saying we'd like to offer you the part. So yeah, it was about. At least a month elapsed from from the first audition. Wow. Yeah, but after that, it was it was literally straight in at the deep end. I flew to LA to be fitted for the costume, and then we shot the movie in Prague. And it was a you know it wasn't lost on me that it was a um, you know it was a huge responsibility because it's been about ten years since you know a predator had been seen on screen right you know and this is one of the most iconic most recognizable sci-fi characters ever ever committed to cinema oh yeah so yeah i was um i was very very aware of uh of my responsibility to do it properly sure and you killed it man and that's, kind of insane. that's crazy i didn't know i like i said i knew you were in it. i didn't know that was your first movie and the fact that so you were in Europe at the time, you got the part, and then they flew you to LA to fit for a costume. Yeah, well, the uh, the costume designers were ADI Tom Woodruff and uh, Alec Gillis. Uh-huh. Uh, 
Oscar-winning uh, creature effects designers and special effects uh, makeup artists. Oh yeah, they were designing and building the uh, all the costumes. Now, Tom Woodruff Jr. has the best job in the world. Not only is he, is he uh, you know, the designer and the builder, but he actually wears the costume. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. He is the alien. <laughs> what? Yeah. Dude. So what What was that costume? It looks heavy. Was it prosthetics, or how are you in that? It was latex foam rubber. Okay. Uh, no prosthetics. Uh, um, a little bit of eye makeup. Mm-hmm. Uh, blacks out the eyes, uh, contact lenses for close-ups, and uh, the the iconic um, face and mask over the top. Gotcha. That's cool. You had to have had a blast. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was huge fun. Sure. You got to fight aliens. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, fighting aliens. Tremendously hard work, but uh, but great fun. Yeah, I remember watching that just last week and being like, the the amount of work involved, because like, I'm assuming some of the aliens obviously had to have been practical, and the fact that you're like this big guy and you're wearing this stuff and like, is is the mask is the mask heavy at all? Because you got that big helmet with like the dreads and stuff, right? Yeah, that's the lighter one. Oh, the <laughs> the, uh, the actual mask, what we call the mech mask, the um, with all the um, servos and stuff that operate the. Uh, with the fangs and stuff, fangs and the facial features, etc. Mm-hmm. That was about, I don't know, about seven, eight kilos, I guess. Wow, sheesh! This is good training for future work that you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, in at the deep end, right? Uh, yeah, very much, a, very much a baptism of fire. The, uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the first scenes that we shot was the um, uh, the scene where uh, the character played by Lance Henriksen. Uh, dies very heroically, and he sets fire to an oxygen bottle with oh, yeah. a with an emergency flare. Wow! Day one explosions as the predator. Well, it was week one. Oh, uh, sure. Three, but uh, as I recall, but I could be wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my wife said to me, she said, I, "You know, I understand how important it is for you to own this character. Okay, <laughs> as much of the action as you as as you want." But please don't let them set you on fire. <laughs> Good so advice. We <laughs> fire scene, and I had a professional stunt double to do the actual burn because it's it is spectacularly dangerous. Oh yeah, he was he was on fire a great deal. Uh, but I for, for for the close-ups, they got they get this what what they call fire gel, and they right. spread it all, all over the costume, and they just set fire to that. And the shot in the, that you see in the film, there's like wisps of flame coming off my shoulders, etc. After mm-hmm. after this big uh, burn has occurred, but most of the takes, I was ablaze. <laughs> the first AD say say to the special effects guy, "No, no, he's not supposed to be on fire. Put him out." <laughs> <laughs> but after we got the scene, the director. Pulled me over to the, uh, you know, to his um, uh, his TV screen, and he says, "Come and have a look at this. <laughs> look, you're on fire." <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute! <laughs> wow, you are not kidding in the deep end. So you got you got lit on fire. You're wearing a costume. You're fighting aliens. <laughs> really oblivious to it because the costume is so big, and you're you know you're you're pretty much you know in your own little world when you're inside a costume, so you're completely oblivious, oblivious to it. Right. It's hot enough in there anyway. Right. <laughs> you don't need help from fire. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. I've, he- I've heard of that happening to people before. Uh, I had Katie Cartwheel on a few weeks ago, and she played one of the caretakers uh, in Episode 8, and she talked yeah. about how they filmed this little you know party scene, and she actually caught fire as well. Like, I guess one of the motors overheated, and she didn't know. So somebody in her earpiece is like, Katie, don't panic. Uh, you're on fire. We're coming to put you out. <laughs> <laughs> and you're surrounded by experts all the time. So as soon as something goes wrong like that. Then, yeah, thank uh, God. <laughs> the stuff you guys attempt. Because that was also filmed, like, where was that filmed, A- Alien vs. Predator? Because it was snowy. Oh, that scene? That scene was shot in the French house, but most of the shooting was shot in... Uh... In um, in Prague, in the studios. Gotcha, gotcha. Movie magic, man. Yeah. That's amazing. 
And then I know you went from there shortly after you worked on a little magical movie called uh, called Harry Potter. Yes, indeed. Well, on AVP, I was working with working very closely with some very talented uh, uh, artists who became very good friends. And they said, "Listen, um, we're involved in the in the Harry Potter uh, movies. Why don't you give uh, Nick Dudman a call mm-hmm. when we wrap?" So I did. And it was about a week after I got home, after finishing, after finishing the film, mm-hmm. he said, "Come down and uh, and we'll we'll talk about the practicalities of this character that we're thinking about." Because up until then, uh, the character of Hagrid, yes, Robbie Coltrane, was, was Robbie Coltrane's character. Yeah, it was done in part by a uh, an, a man called Martin Bayfield, who's an ex England rugby player who's seven feet tall. Oh, so they wanted to use the exactly the same technique to bring to life the character of Madame Maxime, mm-hmm. as played by Frances de la Tour. Amazing. Now she is the the headmistress of the the Beau Baton School, and she is her character is eight foot six inches tall. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to do this as practically as possible with as we were, you know, with hopefully eliminating the need for for CGI. Obviously, the, the, the actress's face would have to be would have to be replaced. But that that they wanted that to be the only thing. Sure. We worked for three months on uh, you know, uh, stealth walking. Uh, I had what I called a lady coach. Who was, <laughs> dancer from uh, the theater in the west end and uh, she, she she taught me um how to act and dance and move and walk in a uh, in a feminine manner and uh, it was uh, it was thoroughly liberating sure that's amazing <laughs> so so uh, did did Robbie Coltrane grab your butt you can tell me <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, uh, my hand was kissed by um, uh, by Michael Gambon I love it Dumbledore, well done, well done, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't know that you. So even you were on stilts, and wow. Well, I, I mean, I didn't know. I, I, she, she's got fantastic uh, stamina. Uh, yeah. At the time, shooting the movie, she was also uh, on the stage in the West End doing a show called The History Boys. Oh, and so she would uh, do her close-ups and stuff in the morning. And then in the afternoon, she would have to depart, and she would go down to the West End and prepare for her stage show. And that's what—that's when I would take over, and we would do all the wide shots and uh, and everything. And one of the shots that we did is the you know the entrance of the Beaubaton where they dance up the aisle of the Great Hall, and Dumbledore greets her and goes her by the hand and kisses her hand. And uh, I was recounting this story the following day to mm-hmm. Francis, and she said, "So." What did I do yesterday? And I said, well, you had your hand kissed by a knight of the realm. <laughs> but, well, I must have enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> the little things like that. That's why I love behind the scenes stuff, learning how this stuff, you know, is brought to life. The, the synergy of, of the two of you bringing that character together. I dig it. I dig it a lot. It was great fun. Yeah. And then I, I know after that you did, uh, I, I'm going to call it the other side of the coin because you were in Prometheus. And yeah. and every now and then there'll be an actor who's done great roles, and he'll be able to play almost like the other side. And uh, you know, you're an alien versus predator. You're a predator that's going around killing aliens. But in Prometheus, you're uh, you you were the last engineer, and uh, aliens are back. And uh, I'm I'm gonna say you don't have the the amount of weapons you had as a predator to defend yourself, if that's safe <laughs> to say. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't know if you recall the movie, but the first weapon I find was um, uh, was Michael Fassbender's head. That's right. <laughs> Which your <laughs> basketball training had to have come in handy there, you know. <laughs> Were you? Was that a prosthetic head, or was that makeup that you had on as as that engineer there? Oh, uh, the engineer makeup. Well, yeah, that was five hours. That was five hours of uh, of makeup. Wow. I've to arrive on set about two thirty in the morning. And be ready to go by about eight. Goodness, that's just getting ready. That's not even like. No matter how many, age. no matter how many times you hear an actor say, "Oh, I had 
five hours in makeup. It was so hard. I was up at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> There's always someone there to greet you. There's always someone. <laughs> There's a team of makeup artists who are there prepped, ready to go as soon as you arrive. And there's a delightful uh, AD or somebody from production who's been put on the night shift specifically to keep you fed and watered with croissants and espresso coffees so that everything goes smoothly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> True. I'm assuming you were, all, you were the engineer the entire time of the film? Uh, yes. Sweet. So with that giant alien that, uh, I mean, it has its way with you a little bit. Um, oh, oh, right. Yeah, that's it. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give you flashbacks, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> What 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 was that like? Being your, did you have a moment in your head when you're like, I've killed all these things before, and now they're getting their revenge. Well, that scene uh, in particular was was one of the scenes that that almost did me in. Oh, I'm sure. They were. I, I was dangling from the ceiling. It wasn't. Just, it wasn't so much the physicality of, of the scene. I, I was uh, hanging from the ceiling on wires with my feet up against the wall, oh. and uh, there was a. A non-movable puppet, shall we say, full-size non-movable puppet, for eye reference, and that's out of that's out of shot. Mm -hmm. so all the tentacles, all the fighting, that was that was done uh, in post. Mm -hmm. But they were pumping, they were pumping so much CO two into the uh, oh, uh, into no. as as smoke that. Uh, that I was, I was a breath away from uh, uh, from passing out. Oh God! Well, on the first take, at least. <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. That was a nightmare. Sure, and you had to fight a giant alien. Yeah. <laughs> they heard how many aliens you killed in the previous movies, and like, we need to get him back, and it's our time now. <laughs> I think I think word got around, and then we 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 cannot have the illustrious Ian White on. And not talk about one of the biggest shows of all time ever. That uh, I found out you were there from the beginning, because in Game of Thrones, correct me if I'm wrong, you played a White Walker first. You are not wrong. You are correct. My first part in the uh, in the series was series one, episode one. Man, uh, and I played uh, one of the White Walkers. I think it's the the. It's not even the second. It's not even the first beheading in Game of Thrones. It's actually the second beheading. <laughs> uh, but I remove uh, someone's head and throw it at his friend, as you do. And it was it was shot in the forest, and it was so dark you can barely see anything. Uh, if you watch it on Blu-ray, actually, it's a lot clearer. Sure, sure. Man, and to think where the show is now, like how pivotal White Walkers are, and like, dude, you're one of the first ones. <laughs> how yeah. how was that like when this is a dumb question that I'm sure you get on a million times and there's no way you can answer it but I'm going to win anyway when, it, when you're filming the pilot of Game of Thrones something like that like do you get the the scale of what's going on like what's being made even from a pilot well it wasn't the pilot it was actually the first episode of the series I um and it wasn't the part even the part that I auditioned for I auditioned for the role of the mountain and I didn't get the part but uh you know, oh. as an actor, an actor, you just get on with your life. And it was uh, uh, three months later, I got a phone call saying, uh, we've got a part that's perfect for you, no need to audition, it's yours if you want it. And uh, there were two of us, actually, that, uh, myself and uh, an actor friend of mine called Spencer Wilding. Oh, great. Great dude. Uh, we, uh, we were shooting this uh, just this one scene, and that was our, you know, that was a sum total of our involvement in, uh, in season one. Wow, I didn't know that. And I know, I know, season two, uh, you were the mountain. So, so I mean, you know, don't give up on your dreams, I guess. Well, exactly. Yes, there was a last-minute recasting. Uh, the reason for which I still do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, they asked me to re-audition, and uh, I got the part. And um, yeah, an amazing, an amazing uh, sequence. Of scenes. Oh yeah, it, and actually, I I actually had a uh, a shot in series two <clears throat> as the White Walker. Oh no, really? But it's so dark you can you can barely see you can barely see anything. It's sure. when uh, it's when Craster Craster takes the baby out 
to the uh, what? To the... That was you. Me carrying the baby off. You took the baby, Ian. <laughs> I <laughs> baby. <laughs> well, well done. You know, you gotta you gotta bulk up the ranks for season four or five. <laughs> you know, I understand. I don't well, agree see... with it, but I understand. And in season three, I started playing. That's when the giants first appeared. Yeah, dude. Dude, such a such good scenes you've been getting. White Walkers, even the mountain. That was a great scene because you're picking who gets tortured. I'll never forget that. Arya's like undercover as a uh, a cupbearer. And then you get scenes with Charles Dance, which is pretty amazing. He's amazing, man. He really is. Dude. So did you have to get fitted for the armor? Or is it like the armor is what it is and hope it fits? It is what it is. Just just put it on. Yeah. Figured. Figured. Is it heavy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, real, it's real armor. You're here to tell me. Everything's real. Everything. So that's the beauty of Game of Thrones. You know, everything's real. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, um, actual metal and like. So, yeah. how, so how did you sit? <laughs> Funnily enough, it's it's more difficult to sit down in that suit of armor than it was to stand up. Really? Yeah. Is it because there's like flaps on the side? I'm assuming that you got to kind of navigate when going down. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, you have to sit down very carefully. No <laughs> one's <laughs> sat down, but you know, there's no getting up. You need, a, you need the hands just to uh, <laughs> to get to your feet again. I believe it. I believe it. I can't even imagine how much that stuff weighs. It's a really nasty piece of work. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right, dude. And then you said season three was when you came around, and that's when the giants were introduced. They go north of the wall. And uh, you played you played more than one giant, I know. I have so far. I've lost count. I know, two, three, <laughs> three. I think three, three giants. Um, yeah, well, it, it reunited me with an old friend, uh, uh, the uh, prosthetics makeup uh, artist Conor O'Sullivan, and he did my makeup on Prometheus. Nice. Uh, Ash of the Titans. Oh yeah. And, uh, he was the makeup. Uh, he was. Uh, the prosthetics makeup uh, supervisor on Game of Thrones up until up until season four when um, uh, when he uh, he moved on. Sure, man, that's bonkers. So it so the giants they're covered in like the pelts and the stuff. There's definitely something on your face in those. Yes, that's that was uh, about three hours in in makeup. Wow. So, C- compared to the mountains armor, were you like this? Isn't that bad? You kind of flow around in your clothes in that one. Well, the, materials, the, the materials are completely different. You know, it, it's all foam and uh, you know, foam and fur. Sure, sure. And then I know you played uh, one one. You know, the 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 best giant. <laughs> I mean, I'm biased. I'm not going to lie. I've read the books. One one's awesome, and yeah, uh, so good. It was a great character, primarily because it's the first time we get to see. One of the giant characters, one of these, you know, aloof, semi savages, the, these wild things that keep very much to themselves. Mm-hmm. It's the first time we get to see him display anything approaching humanity. Yeah, you're and right. Seeing a personality. You're absolutely right. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah you're at. So you you are one one. Therefore, you were involved in. One of, if not the greatest battle sequence in television history. We yeah, uh, two. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're abs- I'm over here thinking Battle of the Bastards, but you're right. There was a battle at the wall as well. How, yeah, how was... cool is your life? <laughs> wow. So, okay. So, I know in... Uh, it, so, the battle at the wall. How was that filmed? Obviously, there's not a 700-foot-tall ice wall. But there, there has to be something, right? Oh, you're talking about series four. That, um, that was oh yeah, one. we're backing up. First time we see one one is, um, is hard home. <gasps> oh my goodness, Ian, you're right. Hard home with like the massive, massive, massive amounts of like whites, and then the Night King's whole like come at me, bro. Yeah, exactly. Wow, it's all meshing together because I'm just geeking out <laughs> about the sequences you've been involved in. Dude. No, but, but well, um, the thing about these characters is the giant characters, they have to be uh, size enhanced. Right. So I only come in to, to shoot my stuff once the edit has been, uh, the edit for the scene has been finalized. Oh, okay. The blood and the mud and the shooting and the human elements and the deaths and everything else, that's all shot first. 
and I come in and I match my performance against what already exists, what already has been approved and edited. Oh, okay. So they have their sequences, and then you're ob- well, obviously. Wow, I'm so dumb. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> you're not like 25 feet tall, so of course you're not running down next to Kit Harrington as Jon Snow. Wow, so that's got to be some crazy level acting as well, as far as like performance capture goes, because you're not surrounded by horses and ripping people up. Well, there are still real elements, though. If there's a, say, for example, if there's a castle gate that that you kind of break through, perhaps broken, <laughs> broken through, then there is at the, there is a castle gate. It's just <clears throat> reduced in size by two thirds. Sure, to be scale with you as a person. Which Man. helps to sell the magic. Dude, that's really cool. That's like Andy Circus level stuff. <laughs> Dude. How fun how fun is that as a giant, like doing something like what are the levels of difficulty would you say going from like a sequence like Hard Home to Battle of the Bastards from your perspective? I mean I like I it's Every scene has its own problems. Every character has its own, you know, set of issues that need to be overcome. Sure, well, sure. The only thought in your mind should be delivering the performance for the director. That is, that that is how I operate. That that's how I think. Every time I go into, you know, into one of these scenes, you know, it doesn't matter how hard it's going to be, how sure. uncomfortable the performance is. Just will the director be happy with the performance? Um, there was one. There was one scene. Uh, the, the first scene I shot for the Battle of Hard Home is when One One smashes out of the longhouse. Yeah, great moment. And obviously, there's a longhouse there, but it's it's reduced in size. Oh, what? You're in a tiny longhouse? Well, well it was just like one end of of, of, of the longhouse. Still awesome. Okay. <laughs> and the director gives me a three to one action. And I go through it like a hot knife, like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, you do. And it disintegrates into matchwood. <laughs> that's so and cool. The director came up to me and said, "That was great. That was absolutely perfect. Uh, so perfect, in fact, that the camera didn't catch up." Oh and... no! <laughs> <laughs> like you're telling me, the perfect take wasn't caught. <laughs> Well, I mean, good thing you're doing cool stuff. So it's not like you don't mind again, right? Exactly, yeah. And then you busted through the gates of Winterfell. Yeah, well, Joss Snow was going to get his castle back. His yeah, that's right. Back. He was going to, get, going to get his castle back. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was one of the things about One One. You know, he he took it upon himself to, um, you know, he owed Jon Snow. Rest in peace, One One. Yeah, Dude. good character. Great character. And that's the other thing about Game of Thrones. It's like, it seems that if you get like a really good death scene, it's like that's the best you can go in Game of Thrones. And, yeah. uh, dude, what a way to go. I've often heard it from the other actors. You know, the first thing they do when they get the script is, is leaf through to the to the end of the scene to see how they die. <laughs> it makes sense. It makes, <laughs> it makes sense with a show like Game of Thrones. I mean, you hundreds of characters died. And, uh, you know, you, like I said, you, you sacrificed yourself for a good reason, and you got a great death scene. And uh, you know what? Ramsey got his, so I think it all works out. You know, it'd be, it'd be much different if, uh, like, say, you know, Ned Stark died in season one. We had to wait, like, four seasons for Joffrey to get his. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just torture. So, you know, great, great scene. Great scene. One one was amazing. Did did you have? Yeah, did you did you have a ton of arrows in you when you were as one one for that scene? There were a great many. I mean, the uh, as I recall, the arrow uh, application process was about forty minutes. Wow, that's got to be that's got to be like an actor's dream in a character up there, full on punching through buildings, covered in arrows. That's pretty cool. And then I know you went to uh, from from Westeros to a galaxy far, far away. We cannot yeah. skip over. You got into Star Wars, man. Yeah, well... I, I, and I know this was in tandem as well, because you had yeah. Game of Thrones as well as Star Wars. Uh, like, you were in Seven, right? I, 
Putted in seven. And you know what? That was, what, four years ago? Yes. Yes, now I'm it was. Using it. It's, it still seems amazing to talk about it. Well, good. I'm here for you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> What what was what was that like? Because I know in seven you were, um, oh, what was his name Crusher Crusher Rudown, the big yeah, guy I, with the metal arms dragging that thing. Yeah, I played two creature characters in episode seven, and I was also Peter Mayhew's stunt double. What you're just racking them up, Predator, uh, Alien Fighter Engineer, White Walker One One, Peter Mayhew's stunt double, killing it, killing it, man. So when you're when you're in when you're in Crusher, are your arms in his arms? Like do you just kind of put them on like sleeves? No, oh, my arms are in his head. Oh what? No way. <laughs> it's uh, the arms are redundant. They um, uh, my heart, my arms are actually operating the neck. Wow. As like a handlebar device inside the head, and I'm operating the neck movements as he walks, and the actual face is operated via remote control in a traditional um, uh, mech head type of setup. Sure. But that scene, uh, that scene was shot in the Abu Dhabi desert. Oh, man. How did you survive the heat? Uh, well, um, we waited 10 days for the perfect sunset. You wow. Wow. Picture perfect sunset you could ever imagine. JJ, when we came back from uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, the first day back in the studio, JJ Evans came up to me and he showed me a still that they'd printed out of that shot. And it looked like it could be hanging on a wall in an art gallery. It was that perfect. Wow. We waited 10 days for the, you know, this perfect sunset. And to alleviate the boredom, I, um, you know, I was there for, for, for one character, that's all. Mm -hmm. and to alleviate the boredom, I, I said to the, um, uh, the creature effects supervisor, that throw me a set of car keys and, and I'll, you know, I'll make myself useful. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> to alleviate the boredom, I was, I was ferrying uh, some of the cast, uh, <laughs> the Peter's cast. To and fro from uh, from the set between the base and the set. There you go. One day I had Kieran Shah nice. and, and Arty Shah on the back seats of uh, this truck, and they had a uh, an assistant with them who had an open mic channel on her radio. Oh. Normally, in a film environment, film set environment, an open my channel will will get you fired. Sure. Actually, no, no. But on this occasion, I heard loud and clear over the radio, somebody go and find Ian White. He's oh, going. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Five mile an hour speed limit on the road out to the set got broken instantly. And I'm bouncing down the road. <laughs> With Artie Shah and Kieran Shah in the back say, slow down, slow down. <laughs> Buckle <laughs> in, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That must have looked amazing. <laughs> Dude, you've got two legends in the back, and you're like, you don't understand. I'm Ian White. <laughs> That's also pretty great that you're like, I'm bored. I'll just drive. Why not? You know, we've got to do something to pass the time. Thank you. So it, when you're you're pulling that thing, because I've seen a behind the scenes of Crusher trying to like come out of a tent, and you're essentially the size of the opening of the tent. Yeah, so, that was where all the uh, all the creatures uh, uh, were were stored, big air conditioned uh, temporary structure. And yeah, the door right, wasn't actually that big. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's just you and Crusher combined make the opening significantly smaller. It was, the, it was the size and weight of a small family hatback. Oh, they, see, these are problems that not a lot of people know that you go through, Ian. Just, <laughs> just, it's like I've heard, uh, I mean, it's nowhere near the same height, but like Liam Neeson, when he w filmed episode one, he was so tall that they had to like spend a ton of extra money to make door openings taller. So yeah, you could just yeah. kind of walk through them. 
Oh, yeah, I totally believe it. Yeah. They probably built the set way too small. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> the, you know, unforeseen costs. Which makes sense that, that there'd be, there would be a tent for the creatures because you're talking foam, latex, all this stuff, and then you're in the desert. Uh, those things don't typically go hand in hand. So when you're when you're a crusher, you said you've got this handlebar you're kind of going with. Was it was the thing you're dragging heavy? Yeah, uh, it's it's basically full of junk. It's full of droids and and space junk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it had substance to it. It was you know mm-hmm. it was quite heavy to drag through the sand. It was um, the uh, the actual process of developing the character. Uh, the first time we tested the sledge. Uh, was in one of the new studio spaces in uh, at Pinewood, which is a beautifully smooth uh, concrete floor. <laughs> which Very was, different. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, I was just dragging it across concrete. And was, okay, this is fine. I can do this. The next time we tested it was on one of the older studio spaces, which had a, uh, a wooden parquet floor, mm-hmm. which was quite as easy. Then we camera tested it outside in the parking lot, <clears throat> uphill, <laughs> which was even less easy. And then when we got out to the desert, dragging it across the sand was the most difficult of all. <laughs> <laughs> they just upped the level each time. Oh, well. oh, man. I love hearing stories about what you guys did in Abu Dhabi specifically because uh, it seems like, like a good example, right? Uh, Tom Wilton, you know, another mm. creature performer, amazing dude. He talked about how he knew him and Derek were going to be in the Lug of Beast and they're, they're going through all this R&D and practicing in the studio. And he's like, well, I'm going to be in the desert. So he starts training a lot and then he like goes in the sauna and he's sitting in the sauna and getting ready. And he's like, the second I got to Abu Dhabi in the desert, I realized all of it was for naught. He's like, it's not even close to the same thing. Yeah, I had some of my coaches coming up to me saying, how am I going to train for the desert? He says, I said, don't even worry about it, because when you get out to the desert, it's going to be completely different. <laughs> <laughs> There's no training. <laughs> and then then I know they brought you back for Rogue One, and your character, how do you pronounce it? Do you say Maroof or Maroof? I uh, pronounce it however you like. It's, <laughs> Fair. Such a cool-looking character. Yeah, he was a great character, you know. And it's a shame that some of these um, characters that look so good on film, mm-hmm. um, they're still unscripted. Yeah, true. And uh, the idea for Morov was that he was supposed to be part of the commando team that uh, attacks Scarif at the end of the movie. Oh. And day one, we're shooting elements of the uh, of the, uh, the Scarif attack, mm-hmm. and we're not actually in the tropics. We're in a uh, in an old abandoned airbase uh, outside London, <clears throat> and there's palm trees and sand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're shooting. We're you know going through this set, you know, like commandos going through the jungle, mm-hmm. and the director shouts, "Cast!" and he says, "Yeah, says, um, uh, you know, all these guys they're going through the jungle, you know." very sort of um, st- stealthy and surreptitious, you know, just, just like commandos. And, uh, you know, can you sort of do something like that? Can you sort of make yourself smaller? <laughs> right away, sir. Absolutely possible. <laughs> what I can do. Uh, obviously, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. You're like, hold on a second. You just kind of squat. Is this good? <laughs> I, tried, I tried kneeling down in the costume and it, it literally broke the costume. Oh, no. Uh, and uh, we had a military advisor on the uh, uh, on the movie, actually in the movie. He's part of the commando team. Oh, nice. Uh, and, and he said to me, he says, look, why don't you just stand behind a sandbank or, a, or, or something? Because you've got a big gun. That's how we would use you. That's how we would use somebody with a big gun. You just stand behind something and shoot. Right. So it's great. Tell the director that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Regardless of whether he told the director or not, uh, the character was um, was quickly erased from that uh, scenario. So we tried it again in the Rebel base, and we shot quite a lot of footage in the Rebel base. But then that would have to tie in with the with the Scarif attack. So the very last thing that we tried was uh, the uh, the Jeddah, the Jeddah town. 
Yeah. That is what that is what it how it's pronounced, isn't it, Jenna? Was it Jenna? Yep, it is. It's however you want to pronounce it, Ian. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um and that's where it's safe. Yeah, yeah, it looks awesome. No, that makes sense because I remember watching one of the first like uh behind the scenes reels is you like sitting on a crate on Scarif, like getting uh, air and stuff. And I was like, Oh, look at that guy. That looks awesome. And I remember uh you had you had did you have a backpack? I think you had a backpack. Giant backpack full of guns and ammo and stuff. Yeah, was that heavy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First time I saw it, we were in the studio, and uh, I'm in the costume, and uh, the guy says, oh, here comes the art department with your backpack. I says, the art department? <laughs> poor guy carrying this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you just hear, like, the operatic music as they're walking it toward you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that Rogue One seems like the movie of heavy backpacks. You know, they, they, I know uh, um, Riz Ahmed who played Bodhi, he talked about how there was like a, a stunt backpack that was kind of light, but the other backpacks with like the cable that he was trying to plug in, he's talked about yeah. just how heavy it was. Yeah, to carry that cable deployment uh, device. And yeah, that thing, that well, you know, it was real. Yeah. Man. So how do you see out of Maruf? Um, I'm looking at the floor. Oh, really? So his head floor. is, his face is on top of your head, I'm assuming? His, uh, his head is actually in front of my head, and I'm looking out. Uh, um, he's got this sort of um, face mask, this sort of breathing apparatus over, yeah. his, over his snout, and I'm looking out the bottom of that. Oh, okay. That's well, a... I can ba- basically see where I'm going. Sure, <laughs> to, to an extent. You, like, you can just make sure you're not stepping on people. Yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. I always like to ask that question, because when you see these creatures like... I've talked to a lot of creature performers now, so I have like a rudimentary understanding of how mechs go on the performer typically. But I'm always mm. interested. I'm like the amazing work that you guys are doing to be able to move and have a performance come through your body language without being able to see a lot of the times. It's amazing, amazing work you guys are doing. Yeah, you have to you have to act big. You know, you have to set you exactly what you just said. You have to send your performance through the costume. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is your performance. You know, if you take the costume off, you take the makeup off, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to do any acting on its own. Right. No matter, no matter how good it looks. Exactly. You know, life to it. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's actually the perfect way to put it, to bring life to these things, like talking about creature performers with Derek and <laughs> Tom, uh, bringing the Lugga Beast, like all the R&D that goes into it, they're like making the creatures breathe and just different things they would do, little things to make it come to life. And, uh, I mean, your characters are no exception. They look real. And that's like the magic of these movies. And I know you, you're you batting a thousand here because then you're back again for episode eight. You played Bali Pindle, who is uh, awesome. I know. Well, I, I'm... I'm in episode eight so little. I'm almost embarrassed to say I'm in episode eight. So that's not good. <laughs> it counts, <laughs> dude. If the Constable Zuvio has an action figure, I think I'm you've, not, you've earned not, a little. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I was in focus for the one spot of. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody out there can focus it <laughs> through <laughs> through Photoshop. <laughs> He's such a cool character too. I love his design because he made it into uh, the visual guides. Well, yeah, but he, he first showed up in um, in episode seven. He was part of the was part of the rebel uh, the rebel cohorts. Yeah, uh, really, he's a really interesting character. Yeah, but again, these these characters are unscripted, so you go where you're told, and you really don't know what's going on in the scene that you're thrown into. Right. So you basically improv. You're thinking you've got to think on your feet all the time. Sure, that's that deep end. It's like you live in the deep end for your acting career, Ian. Well, Bonnie Prindle, um, that is complete sensory deprivation in there as well. Really? You're totally blind? Well, pretty much. I can only see when the mouth is open and the mouth is open. Uh, never open. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're like, ideally, it's like Derek and Pal. He can't see at all. And when the mouth yeah. is open, he's like, oh, I can see a little bit, but, you know, one shot. He's got to run around with a gun blind. I... Dude, I don't know how you guys do it. You guys giving an actual performance, like as a creature living and breathing, and you can't even see? 
It's magic. It's a, what, out, so out of the, the characters that you've played thus far, which is the most comfortable and which is the least comfortable? Oh, uh, what a question. I, you know, I, I, I don't judge them in terms of, of uh, good, bad, least comfortable, most comfortable. Sure. You know, but because they all mean different things for different reasons as well, you know. Absolutely. Uh, the, Predator, the Predator is one of the most iconic sci-fi characters ever devised and it was my first film so it's important to me in that respect um star wars is one of the most you know one of the greatest sci-fi franchises ever game of thrones is the most popular show on tv the engineer was an idea in ridley scott's head for 32 years before we actually shot the movie you know they all mean different things for different reasons sure have you have you like thought back on that sentence you just said? Think about all these characters that you've played so far. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you know, Star Wars, biggest franchise ever, Predator, one of the your <laughs> your resume is one of the coolest things I've ever even heard of. You know, I was in a little, I was in Game of Thrones. You know, Star Wars, like small things. Like you, you probably haven't heard of it. It's fine. Did you did you work on Solo? You had to have. I did work on Solo. Yeah. Sweet. What characters did you play in that? Um. I, well, Moroff appears very, very briefly again in Solo. What? Oh, yes, in the, in on Kessel. The breakout from uh, from the Spice Mines. Yes. Uh, so the thing is, so much of that, so much of it that we shot was was just for options, and you know you've never seen. Sure. I'm so, uh, I'm really excited for when the disc comes out because Same. I'm sure there's a lot more of it on there a lot more of the behind the scenes stuff Mm -hmm. but uh yeah i had four jobs on on uh on solo wow i was a body double a stand-in and a stunt double occasional stunt double for uh jonas one of my most memorable moments on on solo was landing on a landing on an italian mountain top (laughs) and getting out of a helicopter and the first person to greet me on set was the director chris miller Mm-hmm. And he shouts, shouts on my ear over the uh, over the din of the helicopter. He shouts, "The coolest thing about this movie is Chewbacca arriving on set in a helicopter." <laughs> <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. So you were you were uh, on that mountaintop. You were in the Alps. What was colder? And, and you're in Game of Thrones. What was colder? Yeah, what's the coldest you've ever performed in? You've been in a lot of cold places now that I think about it. Well, the Italian mountains in the in the springtime are, are nice and clement. Uh, oh. When we shot, we, we shot season three. We shot the giant scenes in Iceland in November. Oh God. And we were stuck in a little town of Akureyri, which is about an hour and a half away from the uh, the location. For 24 hours, due to heavy snowfall, uh, when we when we were shooting, it was minus 10 degrees. Oh God, I would just freeze on the spot. You figure out how that how cold that is in Fahrenheit. I, I don't know. Um, oh. <laughs> but um, so my body was nice and toasty. Sure. Wrapped up in all the you know in in the costume, mm-hmm. but. My head is in silicon prosthetics, and silicon is a conductor. Yeah. <laughs> my head oh, no. is all the rest of my body is nice and tasty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you've just got an ice cube for a head, and the rest of your body's warm? That is so <laughs> weird. And yet you performed, Ian, like a true thespian. Exactly. Having basically had your your acting career start on like the difficulty level being turned high, like what's something that you've you you learned along the way that like you maybe maybe weren't expecting? Oh, I don't know. I'm really terrible at, at remembering these moments. <laughs> You're like, I just do awesome. I don't think about it. I mean, <sighs> I'm into that. I mean, that is an answer. You know, one of the great things about working for Ridley Scott, you know, that was one of I think one of my seminal moments. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I was, you know, a fan of his work since being a child. Yeah. And when you're being directed by Ridley Scott, you actually don't know you're being directed. Really? 
comes on set and you talk. You talk about wine and rugby and what was on TV last night and who's doing great work, you know, what directors are doing great work in the industry at, at the moment. Anything other than what's happening on set. So that's, that's, that's one of those, like... Um... It, when it's go time, it's go time. But in between, he's like, "Yeah, we're making a movie, huh? That's cool." So, do you watch sports well, last night? Totally relaxed. And um, and when he says action, you, you just do it, and it just happens. Wow! And then you still make a movie as great as that. Some people, some people just know just know how the game is played. You've done you've done some cool things, Ian. You've done some cool things, and I, for one, am very glad that somebody like you is doing these sort of things because when you get someone who has this sort of uh, work ethic and this talent and whatever that it thing is, giving life to all these characters, uh, the audience is the ones who win. So thank you. Well, it is my pleasure. It's my pleasure to watch it. So take that. Uh, can, can you believe we've been talking for an hour already? Yeah, I did just glance at the clock. And um, is that it? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I I appreciate that, you know? I always think about that when I have somebody on because the shows are typically an hour, and I'm like, let's just see what happens, you know? <laughs> and uh, So, I mean, I hope you've had a good time. Like, this has been great for me. An absolute joy talking to you, Brian. If, if you ever want to come back on, if you're doing more cool things, you want to talk about it, I got you. But okay. uh, until then, where can people find you online? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter um, and Instagram. And I used to have a website, but it got hacked by pornographers, so I don't have a website anymore. Ah. <laughs> as, you, as you do, it happens. <laughs> I'm sure I'm that. <laughs> uh, well, I'm on the usual social medias. Fantastic. People definitely got to give you a follow and just uh, tell you how awesome your work is, because it is. <laughs> and uh, until next time, and... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. If you enjoyed this episode, please share and tell your friends. Let them know we got some cool stuff going on over here. Also, uh, I've finally broken down and made a Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash Jedi Brian. On that note, Special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, and Daryl. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you guys how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.